Thanks very much, Sasha. I really appreciate the work you're doing. Um, yeah, look, this is the final session, so we're in the home straight, which is great. I think it's been a terrific day, and I particularly enjoyed that last session on, um, you know, the functional thinking around um, regenerative agricultural landscapes. And really, as a as a sort of like um, uh, an addition to that or a complement to that, is to start talking about how these kind of concepts apply in bushland, sort of wildland, vegetated areas, both in private and public land. So it's, it's a common perception that remnant bushland areas are sort of places of relative natural health and even sometimes referred to as intact or pristine. And that certainly is the case in some areas or close to it. Um, and that the focus of conservation is to keep the threats away and to link up the, 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 the discrete um, patches, you know, with um, reveg in, in cleared zones in between. Um, uh, but in, in, in effect, in many areas, particularly like, like the gold fields, um, the impacts of past things like mining and clearing, overgrazing and overcutting, et cetera, has caused severe damage and it's locked a lot of bush into uh, a highly degraded sort of regrowth state. And in, in a functional sense, uh, many of these areas, as we've learned today, are are highly leaky and desertified because of poor surface condition, soil health and so on. And that when you get a rainfall event, even a small one, you can get runoff and, and loss of that moisture to the system, which is um, a problem ecologically. Um, and uh, in, in, in an age of climate change, uh, that can even can be even further exacerbated. And, and this work workshop is to highlight the, the activities and projects of a number of practitioners across central Victoria that we've, we've, we've been working with. And uh, we're very pleased to present this panel of esteemed practitioners and workers across the area. So we're gonna first of all hear from Peter Mitchell, who is um, a, uh, who used to work with the public service, is now retired, also was a uh, secretary for Biolinks for, for many years, and is now spearheading a program to do restoration work at the Australian Lighthorse Memorial Park in Seymour, where he now lives. Um, I'm going to do a presentation in conjunction with Shane Monk um, with regards to a special biolinks project that we've been running for the last few years, um, which is in the Spring Plains area south of Heathcote. Um, Shane is a Torgrong man and going to give his particular perspective of the project. Um, Gary Hendy is a practitioner um, and general sort of uh, all-round all uh, champion of operational and practical things in central Victoria, who heads up a group called Tree Headquarters, and he's got a wealth of experience on regeneration and restoration techniques, um, and he's going to talk about that. Patrick Pickett is an ecologist with Parks Victoria, and Patrick's been heavily involved in some of Parks really interesting projects around uh, improving the habitat quality of the great box ironbark forest using ecological thinning techniques. And, Patrick's been involved with that for a long time and has a lot of knowledge in that space. And finally, hopefully if Glenn um, from Bush Heritage turns up, uh, I don't think he's here yet, is he Sophie? Um, uh, he'll talk to us about a project that we're collaborating on up in the Nardu Hills area near Wedderburn. Um, and I guess if worse comes to worse, I can certainly say a few words on behalf of Glenn and Bush Heritage. So we'll see how we go with, in that regard. So, oh, he's on his way. He just oh, that's good. and he's going to be joining us. So that's Excellent. Great. All right. Yep. So over to you, Peter and, so, and Sasha. Yep. Okay. So I'll just pop um, my screen sharing on uh, and make sure that we are all seeing the right thing. I hope that is a PowerPoint presentation for you. That's the correct one. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Thanks, Paul. Um, I just want to talk about a restoration project we've just started at the Australian Light Horse Memorial Park in the southeast part of Seymour. It's on the land of the Tongarong people. This land was taken for grazing about 1840 and at least partly cleared for timber and firewood. The Victorian Mounted Rifles used Seymour as a base from 1887 and the Australian Army took over after Federation. And the site was very intensively used during the first during the two world wars. This is a picture of the grey box slopes that we were working on as they were in, in 1917. Um, pretty cleared, lots of drain holes, tent sites, all sorts of stuff, not much on the ground. The army finally moved out in the early 18, 1960s and the land was then used for grazing and was generally a wasteland until the park was established in 1996. Next slide, thanks, Sasha. Um, slide. After the army left, the problem 
but probably around the 1950s, 1960s period, there was a massive regeneration of trees and particularly grey box on these lower slopes where the tent sites were. The forest in this photo is a typical even age stand of trees that may be up to 60 years old. The ground is covered in dry litter. There are no logs. The soil surface is mostly hard packed clay with a, with, a, with a crust. When it rains heavily, the litter is just swept away. When we ripped the land during the last winter, we came up with hard dry clods of clay under a thin layer of humus. Even it was quite dry, dusty or whatever. There are very few understory plants in the area. There's a couple of generations of golden wattles and expanding population of sifton bush, as you would expect. Um, but ground clover includes a variety of native species, but the overall cover of that ground cover is less than 1%. Next slide, please. We set up a nine monitoring plots and measured the trees. The table on the right shows that the majority of the trees were between five and 15 centimetres breast height diameter, pretty small. There were only 10 trees above the EVC benchmark of 70 centimetres and another 10 large trees with spreading canopies and generally few younger trees beneath the canopy, just richer soils and annual grasses, as you can see there. This particular tree that we're looking at is, was unusual on the site and it was also surrounded by lots of babies, which you often see uh, around the sticks. We counted 150 small trees within 15 metres of the trunk, and that can't be good for the parent tree. Next slide, please. This map shows the Lighthorse Park on the left and the adjoining Seymour Bushland Park on the right. These parks and much of the surrounding land was used by the army. About 100 hectares of the two parks are dominated by grey box, and I'd say about three quarters of that is these even age stands with hard surfaces and very little understory. Our project area is in yellow. Hang on, back a bit. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is, is our project area is the, in yellow on the map. It's only about four hectares, so it's very much a toe in the water approach to what is a very public community park. The primary purpose of our project is to enhance the vegetation and moisture retention on the site, as we've talked about all day today. Um, but we're also using it as a demonstration for ecology in action with a view to further restoration projects in the two parks. We've set up different treatment areas to assess the effects of ripping and thinning rates, and the results will be used to inform the committees of management. Both parks are managed by committee, community committees and the wider community. Next slide, please. Now, extrapolating widely from our nine plots, we came up with the following average densities for four distinctly separate sections of the project areas. Two areas have large old trees, those areas three and four. The highest density was around the 1600 trees per hectare, which is very dense. Although the trees are patchy, this density equates to an average spacing of about two and a half meters between trees. We originally proposed moving 75% of the trees based on figures for the Box Ironbark project that um, Patrick may talk about later. But we didn't have any figures on the original density or spacing of, of those trees at the time, and we had no opportunity to check out the Box Ironbark forest site since. Uh, we felt that this 75% thinning rate would be seen as acceptable given the visual impact of a clearing in a community place. But looking more closely into the spacing of our trees in the project area, we realized we needed to remove much more than 75%. The large trees in the area have canopy covers around seven to eight meters radius to the drip line, a density of hundred trees per hectare, that leaves a set 10 meter spacing, would require the removal of about 90% of the trees and 94% of the trees in area one. This is still conservative, a conservative density for the open grassy woodlands that would have been existing in the past. So we have aimed for around a 15 metre spacing. In area one, that remains removal of about 97% of the trees, which is, whew. Um, in August, we applied for a conservation work exemption from the, native vegeta from the native vegetation regulations. We met council and DELP officers on the site and received real encouragement to go ahead. We'd previously prepared a detailed habitat mapping report and a vegetation management plan, and also had a report of a community workshop we ran with Paul and Gary uh, in 2019 before COVID. We also developed a project plan, including monitoring and possibility of revegetation. 
In particular, we noted the presence of plants we needed to protect under the Flora and Fauna Guarantee Act. We sent all that off on the 17th of August and approval came through on the 15th of September. Really good work from the department. As you will hear from others, there is a lot of similar work going on around Victoria. And I think tree thinning has become a well-recognized part of ecological restoration and is acceptable as an exemption to the clearing regulations. So work has begun. Um, we really wanted to harvest the activity of soil disturbing animals to restore our degraded woodland as we, as, uh, as was mentioned earlier today, but our squads of echidna were not doing much in the hard, dry, grey box area. So the best we could come up with was Gary and his dingo, as you can see on the right. The entire accessible area was contour ripped to about 15 centimetres. The smaller machine and shallower ripping allowed Gary to move between the trees and avoid damage to roots and other vegetation. Since then, we've had good rain and some of the rip lines have been pools of long pools of water slowly entering the soil. It's a very hard soil to, to penetrate for, for water. Um, so it takes a while, but it's lovely to see those long pools of water sitting there. Next slide, please. This is the crunch. Gary started filling on Monday, and as you can see, the results are pretty dramatic. As, a, as, a, as an additional activity, um, we've, we've done a lot of publicity work. We've uh, put up signage to say that this is what we're trying to achieve. We put articles in the local paper, which will come out next week, because Gary started on Monday. Um, we also, uh, have, have, there's an app for the, an interactive app for the park, and we're putting an article on that. So people coming near that area with the app will have a little explanation of why we're doing this work. Hopefully that will circumvent some of the criticism that will come from such a drastic looking activity. Then what happens next? Natural recolonization and spread of native shrubs and ground cover from adjoining areas will be slow. Um, Sifton bush is likely to be the big coloniser um, and it's going to colonise the area much very rapidly and we're also concerned about the spread of Bergen. Though I think Bergen, Bergen in this area I think is on the edge of its ecological zone and hot dry places like this north facing grassy woodland uh, is probably not conducive to a lot of uh, Bergen spread as it is further up in the Trowool Valley. Um, with the Sifton bush, we could we slow this recolonization by removing parent plants, but only up to a point. It is a massive, massive um, regeneration happening already. Uh, Sifton bush does mature and it does naturally thin in a few years. So perhaps we shouldn't get too anxious about it anyhow. I don't know. Interested in on comments on that one. Annual grasses will also spread. There's, they're abundant under the trees and they're going to spread wherever there's a bit of rich soil, I think. Um, again, there's not much we can do about it. It's probably adding to it, but we also need to look at how we make sure that the native vegetation does well. Most of the, this is the grassy woodland, this is the site we're looking at, um, and, but and the closest source of recolonizers is uphill, but it's in heathy dry forest. Um, so there's lots of lots of forbs and lots of shrubs coming down the hill, which will help recolonize the area, but very, very few grasses. So the next step for us is to get some grass seed, which we're trying to organize from the Aroa Arboretum and seed, the Golden Broken Seed Bank, um, and put those into the drip lines. We'll continue monitoring over the years to see how well all those species are doing and what more we need to do, as mentioned by um, the first speaker this morning. Um, and then we allow slow ecology to do the rest. Uh, and that will hopefully please our grandchildren at least. Thank you. Fantastic, Peter. That was that was great. I'm looking forward to um, yeah, getting some, some dialogue and questions around that. Um, we're going to move on uh, to the next one, which is the one uh, myself and Shane are going to talk about a project that Biowins is involved with near Heathcote, which we call the Spring Plains uh, micro, shed, micro Watershed Restoration, which is a similar sort of project to what Peter's described, but on a, on a bigger scale, but I'll, I'll go into that in a, in a bit. Before I do that, I just wanted to, to get Shane to say a few words from his perspective. Um, Biolinks is very keen to work with Indigenous groups around the, the, the landscape and we're still developing those relationships, but Shane has kindly agreed as a, a talk wrong man to, to give his perspective. So hopefully um, 
uh, if we can, uh, you know, get a, get a, a bit of a sense of uh, where he's coming from and how that can add value to the project. Thanks, Shane. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, as you heard, my name is Shane Mark. I'm a proud Tunnerong man. Um, first of all, I'd just like to pay my respects to my elders, past and present. Um, so, I, my I've, I've worked in a in the natural resource management sort of area for probably twelve years now, up on um, Tunnerong country, and the the area of around Heathcote where the Spring Plains um, project is is the area is completely sort of upside down. The the soils of, from mining has it's just pretty much all gone. There's no small um, uh, plants, not much grass. Um, that area would have sort of been an open sort of woody grassland sort of area. Um, with all the work that I've done and workshops I've been to and stuff, we've lost probably not even well over 90% of our grassy woodlands, which was really um, a big part of our um, food source and medicines for our traditional, um, for our ancestors. So to be able to do, to work alongside um, Paul in this project, um, and I'm talking as a Tanarong person, but I'm talking on my, what I think, not on, um, I'm not talking actually for Tanarong, but um with, with the project, I think this is going to be a great outcome because not far from there, we've, you've got the, um, the Great Town National Park. That's a really, really highly sensitive area for Tunnerong. We've got sites there and the, just the grass trees and some of the other areas around that area. It's just really sensitive to Tunnerong. So I think with the work that I've done with Paul and Sophie out on the, on the ground and seeing what they're doing, I think it's going to be a great result for all the box iron bark sort of country. I think um, we, if we don't do something soon, we're going to lose a lot of that box iron bark country. Um, pretty much like um, Paul said, the same as um, seeing what Gary did with the, the ripping and stuff like that. If we don't do stuff like that in these areas, um, like Paul was saying, the smallest amount of rain just washes away there's no way for that soil, that um, water to get into the soil. So I really, like I said, my, my personal opinion is I think this is absolutely a great opportunity to work in a large scale and see what we can do for, for this sort of country because between Tanarong country and Jarjaran country, there's a lot of this um, area that has been destroyed through gold mining. And if we don't do something soon, like I said, we're going to lose it. Um, there's so much um, animals, uh, all your little lizards and that. There's just um, there's just no nowhere for anything sort of out there. I think we could bring back a lot of medicine plants, a lot of food plants, and when we bring all that stuff back, we start bringing in back in all the little animals and all the insects and stuff. So I think this is a great opportunity for for us um, to work together. And um, I am sort of talking with Tanarong to make sure that we are a part of this because I can see this project being a really, really great project. And um, I wanna sort of be a part of it from the start. I don't wanna be jumping on at the end when we realize that it's, oh yeah, that's a great idea. It's, it's working, we should be a part of it. So I've been sort of pushing to make sure that we're there from the start and because we can use this information we get from this um, project, we can use right across a lot of our country to um, bring our country back to sort of more native area, um, so sort of more natural sort of country. And um, yeah, hopefully bring back a lot of our bush tucker plants and medicine plants into these areas. So yeah. Thank you very much, Shane, that's fantastic. Um, you'll, you'll hang on for the rest of our um, uh, workshop so um, yeah. you can make some questions. Anyone got any questions at dialogue, the end, yeah. Yeah. So just hang on there and I'll just do a quick presentation just to give people a heads up about the um, about the project. So if you just bear with me, I'll share my screen. Can people see that? Yep. Okay. Um, right. So uh, just uh, yeah, quickly, I'm just going to go through uh, the, the project, the problem. 
uh, basically we, we know the history of this of this goldfields region, the gold mining and the intensity of the impact and, and occupation in the in that early in that early period. Um, this is a, a shot near Castle Main, the exhibition pass area, as it was back in those days or shortly thereafter. And then this is what it looks like today, and there's been a lot of regrowth, which is great. Paul, um, do you want to enlarge your um the put it on view? Oh, sorry. For you? Is that how's it? how's that? Is Great. that better? Um, Sorry about that. that. That's better. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so this that's what it looks like today. And uh, if you look closer, though, even though the, the regrowth is obviously a positive thing, unfortunately, there's a lot of damage that's that's gone on, and that damage hasn't really been repaired. And a lot of the underlying processes that we've talked about today are still very, you know, dysfunctional. Um, and you know, as Peter showed before, a lot of the a lot of the bushes like this, you know, just multi-stem regrowth, very young, and uh, not a lot on the ground, just leaf litter. And interestingly, one of the reasons why there's so much leaf litter is because um, the leaf litter, is, the soil's not active that much, and as a result, the leaf litter just doesn't recycle quick enough, and so it accumulates. Um, and but th there are spots around where you do have understories that are still relatively intact that have somehow um, escaped the impacts and. And they, they can look like, like this, and this is in spring, a really good site, obviously. Um, and then also drainage lines as well. We get original similar sort of chain of ponds type structure that's also been referred to today. And so these can be like the living reference areas that give us a bit of a sense of what these systems may have been like in the past and, and give us a bit of a, an aspiration and a goal to head to for the future. Um, uh, this, this slide was John showed earlier. So it, it's um, this is a classic example of the galley that's gone on. Um, and whenever it rains, the water just purges out the system, hence the leaky landscapes theme that we've been talking about all day. And this is what it looks like shortly after the rain stops and all the vegetation cures uh, because it's, it's mainly exotic short-lived stuff that doesn't have the legs to, to withstand the, the summers. Um, so the approach we're going to take is we're going to use a combination of uh, traditional practices around uh, forestry and civil culture and also ecological thinning techniques, which Patrick will talk about soon. And in fact, this shot is of the Parks Victoria trial um, that was conducted nearby the site. And we're also going to use landscape function approaches and, and this idea of trying to get break up the soil and get more moisture infiltration uh, and also assisted kind of reveg with direct seeding type techniques. And so the plan is to focus on this micro catchment south of Heathkit called Peter's Gully. Uh, compare it with the gully next door called White's Gully, and it has three components. There's a, the, the, the valley bottom, and there's the slopes, and then there's the upper ridges. So in the valley bottom, we're going to look at uh, some thinning techniques. We're going to look at um, some minor earthworks and, and, and also placing logs and other barriers to try and hold up moisture flow and build up natural scours and ponds that are in that small valley today, and also do some planting of appropriate species. And in the slopes, we're going to do thinning as well, but also some ripping on the contours using a machine and some direct seeding of grasses in particular. Common wallaby grasses are one of the target ones we'll go for, but that, that could be others down the track, but that's what we'll start with. And then in the upper slopes, we're going to look at um, more thinning and uh, look at monitoring kangaroo pressure, which is quite high up there. And um, where appropriate um, down the track, we'll look at uh, control measures uh, and also some exclusion um, to monitor the impact of kangaroos as well. Um, and so the idea is to get a, a, a sort of a foon chain effect. So by improving the, the, the base um, processes, we get a, an improvement in the whole food web. So right up through the primary producers and, and consumers, right up to the, to the apex predators and the system get benefits. And our monitoring system will be tailored accordingly. Um, in progress, so so far we've done some baseline work. Um, on vegetation and birds. Here's some example of the data we've collected or the data sites. Um, we've also going to use remote sensing uh, as a way of um, detecting change and we've done some fundraising and seed collection. Um, and it, it, and this, this really couldn't be possible without partnerships. So i uh, just finish off, this is the final slide showing Shane next to one of the biggest grey box trees left in the area. And just to highlight the, the need for or the, the, the absolute critical nature of, of partnerships with the Parks Victoria, Greater City of Bendigo, the Ross Trust, the Ian Potter Foundation, and also the Australian Environment Grant Makers Network. We've raised quite a lot of funding from individual generous philanthropists, some of whom are uh, online, hopefully, at the moment. Um, 
and we also look to uh, you know to raise further funds in the future for this sort of vital work. So that's what I'll just stop sharing, and we'll move across to our next presenter, which I think is uh, Gary. Is it? Yes, Gary. Hello. Hello. I think I've just unmuted the computer. Is that right? You have. So oh, I'll share my. I'll show you my screen now, which will put some of your images up for you, um, and you can talk us all through it. Well, Sasha, if you could please just move through the photos at a pace that you think suitable, because they're not all relevant to exactly what I'm talking about, and okay, people can just problem. have a look, please. No problem at all. Okay. Are we right to go? Um, hello, I'm Gary. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Paul, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm an environmental contractor and I do a lot of ecological thinning work for the benefits that have been discussed already today, which I won't run through too much. Um, one of the important things for me, if people are contemplating doing environmental thinning on private land, is that you need to have in your mind what it is that you're trying to achieve and also uh, be emotionally prepared for it because as Peter has shown in photos earlier, it is a very uh, confronting, can be a very confronting site. And even people who are signed up and are all for this process, uh, they can find it pretty challenging because this site here is highly compacted due to varying changes in land practices, as Shane mentioned earlier about the damage to the landscape, uh, the trees are um, germinating opportunistically and they're covering the soil, which is nature trying to do its thing, but they're at the expense of many other um, values. Uh, part of it, a lot of this is water retention and biodiversity. Is there another shot there at all, Sasha? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, tree cover in our area with the different ecological vegetation classes um, varies between about 10 to 40% of cover in our landscape. If it's grassy woodland, for example, it might, or grassy woodland would have about 15% tree cover. This is a grassy woodland site over at Goba. You can see in the background there, that's actually really good native pasture uh, with thickets of eucalypts in there. Um, and grassy, grassy, grassy valley forest would have about 20% tree cover with, um, you know, so that we're looking at spacings and Peter was talking stocking rates earlier. We're talking about spacings and thinning of these trees to try and attempt, you must imagine like a, a mature tree size uh, and how big those canopies are. So for us to thin down, to spacings of 15 to 30 or 40 metre spacings. You look at the number of trees in here and how much has to come out. If you're thinking about doing that, that's a big deal. There's a lot of work involved and it actually makes a pretty big mess. Um, but the benefits of this, it increased a very good symbiotic relationships with other plants and other animals. The problem with a landscape like this is that there's no benefit, because there's only trees, there's usually only uh, insects that eat trees. You need a much more diverse landscape so that you have symbiotic relationship with, um, with other animals that are beneficial to trees like birds. So they have nesting places in shrubbery to eat insects. Look at the lurk on the red gums around the place, you know, lack of small birds that are feeding on them. Um, and there's also lots of beneficial insects that are very beneficial to trees. Uh, this is a site again over at Goba. Firewood is a resource that is a result, can be a result of environment, uh, ecological thinning. It's a very legitimate resource. It's a sustainable resource. That means that you can sustainably manage your thin wood for your own use and it also reduces the, well, hopefully stops the requirement for people to be collecting timber illegally from roadsides and cutting down dead trees. Like this is a really good way to manage your firewood. You know, year to year, it's terrific. Um, <coughs> pardon me. 
uh, considerations with in, are there trees leaving marsupials in move from tree to tree? Uh, no, usually these trees are really small. Um, they're just, all trees are habitat. Here's an excellent photo. These trees are tiny. I'm just about to address timing in implementing these works. Spring's not a great time because birds are nesting and that type of thing. So always look for nests in trees. But these trees don't provide a lot of habitat, although you know you can see there's more structure in this photo as well. But those grey box there are really tall, thin saplings. There's a lot in the foreground that have already been removed. There are after photos of this. On this side in particular, we've thinned, laid the logs across the contour to break up and collect. Um, break up water and collect sediment, but also we've chipped um, the foliage across the site to cover that bare concrete like ground from the grey box. Um, wet, if you're thinking about doing this work, don't work in wet ground because it creates soil disturbance and can encourage erosion. That's also a bit of a danger. Uh, if you're going to do this work in summer, be mindful that it's hot uh, and be weary of fire um, issues. Carry fire protect, prevention equipment and use equipment that's got spark arrestors on it. Don't work on total fire bandos. Um, <laughs> and potentially start earlier in the day to avoid the heat of the day. Um, if you're going to do this work, be mindful of the weather. Strong winds are not good for falling trees. Um, electrical storms and wet slippery down conditions would be avoided. And potentially you can stage your thinning works, talking about that before about the confrontation of the site and the disturbance that we, or the visual disturbance that it is. You can potentially think, well, if we're trying to achieve a 30 metre spacing between our trees, we might thin it down to 15, 10 to 15 metre spacings, you know, first up, and then a few years down the track, go back in and take those other trees out to achieve that desirable EVC type of spacing, which then, you know, from a management perspective, you're not doing a whole lot of work all at once and potentially you're, you know, securing a forward supply if that's what you, you know, if that's of any value to you. Um, resi residual materials on site, like the crowns. Uh, on a site like this, leaving the materials on the ground is a good thing because it helps collect uh, runoff and break down and create soil, which is good for soil biology. Um, but on better quality sites, this is the same site five years after the initial one. That's all kangaroo grass, it's just terrific. Um, again, I think we've probably been, we could go back in and take more trees there. This is a site up at Goba. I've been doing work there for quite a few years. Um, but on better quality sites, you may want to remove the head and I'm getting to that, Kylie. Um, if you want to remove the heads, because the heads can smother out if you've got good quality vegetation, but it is worthwhile and you should leave some residual materials for habitat. Um, if you're thinking about doing this work, check out if you need to get a permit or not. There are general exemptions for this. These are, if the trees are less than 10 years old, or if the trees are less than 10 centimetres at dot breast diameter, which is about the width of my hand. But do check it out because there are good reasons to get permits. Uh, for, yeah. And I, as a contractor, I won't do work unless I see one. Um, tree selection when you're removing trees. Um, trees, so if you're looking at trees, try and retain the larger ones. Large trees are good. They'll get to be bigger trees sooner and they'll provide all the benefits that big trees do. Location, spatial separation. You try and space the trees out in a nice aesthetic arrangement. We don't want a plantation. We don't want them to be 20 metres by 20 metres right across the site. Um, species, if you've had to get a permit, um, a permit will usually be quite specific about what trees you can remove. Uh, that's a 28 year old gray box. That's potentially the size of tree that you might be looking at if you've got a really tight space. I know that because I planted that tree. 
Um, and we can be discriminatory when thinning trees. I try to leave uh, a great diversity of trees. Usually if you're thinning, it'll be one species that's the dominant species, uh, potentially grey box or red gum or something or iron barks, and thin it out and leave other species so that they get a chance and it increases diversity across the site. Uh, I'm modelling the latest in professional tree operating equipment there, uh, chainsaw pants, steel cap boots, helmet with hearing protection and eye protection, and high vis in a professional environment. Um, genetic diversity in the species with species selection. Within tree growth, you get um, you get uh, what can be called a synchronous growth or co-dominant branch attachment. Uh, this is natural and not a problem, but if it is growing near infrastructure or high use areas, you should consider removing it because it has potential to fail. fail. Uh, there's a selection of the gear that you might want to have on hand. You certainly want to have the first aid kit and the PPE. Um, with regard to post felling treatments, uh, we poison cut stumps. This, this method stops coppicing. Coppicing is where you get eucalyptus regrowth, which was on a slide that Paul provided earlier. It was quite a substantial stump. And what if you do not treat the stump, you get the same growth back in one or two or three years as what you've just removed. And it's a, it's a problem. Direct application of herbicide into the stump reduces the amount of herbicides used in the environment and it's very target specific. If you're thin, thinning near large trees that have lots of saplings around them, be very wary of applying herbicide under, to cut stumps under trees because it can translocate through a connected root system and can affect the large parent tree. You can, in this situation, you can significantly reduce the herbicide uh, mix or just don't poison it and then maybe, or poison half of them and come back and, you know, maybe fresh cut the stumps and do the other half next year. Because uh, you can introduce a lot of herbicide to the system doing that. If it's one or two saplings near a big tree, no big deal, but just be mindful of that because we are trying to save these big trees. Um, some people may want to keep coppice. The options are you can go back and continue to break off the new growth until a tree runs out of energy. Uh, this is a very time consuming and ongoing commitment. Or you can go back and foliar spray the coppice growth. Uh, I'm not a fan of this because uh, it's not so target specific and you are putting more herbicide out into the environment which we're trying to avoid. Um, uh, if you're doing this, safety is number one. We don't want anyone to get hurt. And if you get hurt, how are you going to continue doing this? Um, so as I say, buy good quality, invest in good quality PPE and use it always. If you're going to use a chainsaw, go and get some training. Uh, local TAFE or Creswick School of Forestry, a uh, good place to have a look. Um, could we get the next slide, please, Sophie? Uh, Sasha, sorry. Yep, do you have um, a particular image you're after? Uh, just whatever the next tree one is. <clears throat> oh, okay, cut stumps. What do we do with cut stumps? We do not do that. That's a slash cut. That's a particularly lazy thing to do. And if you leave that on site, that's very, very dangerous. It's a puncture thing and it's a trip hazard. Uh, this is how I usually like to leave my stumps, cut low and flat to the ground. Uh, and then poison applied soon after the application, of, um, soon after the cut, or leave the stump up high, cut it at waist height. People can see it. If stumps have holes in them, they're habitat. Um, but usually I would remove a stump to flush to the ground as much as practicable. Um, my feeling is that almost all sites that we've worked on are conservatively thinned. But saying this, there is plenty of scope for return, ongoing follow-up management. Uh, be safe doing this work. Um, drink plenty of water. This is active physical work and you need to work to your capacity. Take your rests, keep your chainsaws sharp, 
and drink plenty of water. Um, other than that, there's a few before and after shots coming along. If we could just scroll through them, and that's pretty much for me, thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Gary. You got those shots coming through, Sasha? Um, possibly. <laughs> yeah, I hope that was relevant. Oh, it was great, Gary. It was really good. Thank you. It's uh, it's great to get the practitioner perspective, and yeah, you know, I can't can't emphasize further. You know, this is a, a serious business, and you've got to take it seriously. Do all the all the background, you know, work, and get all the safety stuff right. Um, absolutely crucial. So thanks for that very much. So is this just some before and after now, Gary? Is it that you? It's down the, the last. Oh, two just slides. that's like this one and this one. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah, that's just showing how big a tree can get. Yeah. So this is a grey box woodland at Broadford. So that's before. And uh, there should be an after one. Yeah. Yeah, we saw them, but yeah. maybe after oh, before, yeah. The after. All right. Well, we might... Uh, thank you very much, Gary. That's fantastic. Um, we might move on and uh, get Patrick to... Um, to do his presentation next. You there, Patrick? You're on. You're on mute. Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Go for it. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, I work as as Paul said. I work as an ecologist uh, in Parks Victoria's. Uh, environment and science division and um, I'm in the research partners uh, group and uh, I've had the uh, privilege of uh, being involved in this project for a long time I, I guess the best way to describe this is that uh, I'm a custodian rather than anything else uh, the project uh, took about four years to complete and um cost several million dollars involved nearly 100 people and uh, that's a very rare thing these days in state government um and so i'm just going to quickly run through um aspects of this uh the uh, trial was an outcome of the 2002 uh oxide Park parks and reserves program by state government uh following extensive uh, investigation by the uh, Environment Conservation Council, which is the forerunner of the of VIAC. Um, uh, so, what's ecological thinning? I think people have uh, have actually answered this question today, but it's really around uh, tree felling uh, for conservation objectives, and um, certainly going back twenty years ago, there was a lot more suspicion that this had no place in national parks and reserves. And I think that's uh, changing. And it's changing because of the community, not necessarily any drivers in state government. So very quickly, um, as part of this parks program, uh, an ecological management strategy was recommended. And then to support that, uh, you can see there some, some objectives of that. Uh, the, the major question was, um, be, because it was a heavy recommendation of the ECC, uh, could ecological thinning be used to accelerate the development of older growth conditions of ecosystem function, forest structure and habitat diversity? So all those topics have come up today. Uh, that's pr primarily what we've talked about. Um, I'll just go through some outcomes because I tend to be very long winded and I might run out of time. So I'll get the, some of the good stuff out the front. Um, the this uh, project had uh, a considerable amount of um, empirical uh, monitoring associated with it before and after thinning, and then some, some smaller projects uh, more recently. Uh, there's just measurable tree growth from uh, measured by uh, diameters um, in 2016. Uh, it was actually a surprising amount of tree growth. Um, it resulted in a, also a measurable amount of canopy uh, through light penetration, 
which is a really useful way to understand what to do with thinning. Increased coarse woody debris volume and structure, and I'll show some photos later, that's really important. Increased fine debris and litter, and uh, observable changes to understory structure. And again, there were a lot of changes to numbers of species, but but a tremendous uh, diff distinct difference in cover and um, flowering. Increase in, in some of the functional groups, and I'll come to that a bit later. And there, there was the, one of the few downsides was uh, short-term disturbance and invasion of some herbaceous weeds, which are now less apparent. Um, and and uh, what we can understand, but uh, could do more work to, to provide us hard evidence. Um, the uh, increased canopy regeneration from the, the various thinning treatments, uh, improved ecosystem function, like we've been talking about today, the cycling of nutrients and carbon and water, uh, which are heavily connected to the functioning of invertebrates and microbes, fungi, uh, other life forms. Uh, another one, interesting one, again, that we've talked about today, resilience to cope with weather events. So we're getting increasing numbers of, of storms that have heavier falls of rain and stronger winds. And it was counterintuitive. Uh, the uh, larger, stronger trees and open uh, mixture of open spaces is, is actually a, provides a more resilience for woodland. Um, contribution to patch at different scales. This is really important. Some of the universities have done fantastic work in trying to understand um, this and its uh, importance for birds in particular. And uh, it, there's a tremendous role for thinning in uh, uh, creating a patchy landscape, um, I guess, at the scale of, of a sort of 100 hectares sort of scale as well as uh, uh, landscapes. Uh, we've not seen anything that could be deemed harm of, of, for, for any kind of forest value. There's no change to fire risk that we can understand. Uh, fire is low risk in box bark forests compared to other parts of Victoria. And just finally, before I get on with some detail, what we do see is, is, is potentially a glimpse of woodlands the way they might've been. And it is, it is a, uh, sort of a synthetic or manufactured woodland look, but it's it's better than uh, some of the densely uh, stocked uh, trees. Um, so very quickly, th these are a couple of the the themes that we use to design treatments, um, creating a spaced or patchy nature of, of box bark, and also reduce the density of trees. Um, and you can see the photo I've got here. Uh, and we've seen lots of photos from other people this afternoon about how dense box bark or a heathy dry forest can look. So the, the, these were the, the variables in the trial. Um, there were four geographically spread out sites. They're, they're all the sites, that I'll show a map in a minute, are about 100 kilometres apart. Uh, we needed to have treatments for crown patchiness and stem density. Uh, a latecomer to the project um, was removing uh, and measuring uh, timber on the floor, uh, coarse woody debris uh, variants, and it, that was partially because of trying to further understand habitat, but also the trying to understand um, the potential impact of um, theft of coarse, coarse woody debris from forests, which is still an issue. And finally, just monitoring of uh, all those things I talked about before, biodiversity, uh, forest structure, habitat. So here, here are the four sites. Uh, most of these uh, places, most of these reserves were new uh, to uh, the park system in 2002 and were, were ex-state forests. So they all had forestry histories as well as the um, uh, widespread clearing in the gold rushes. And, and predominantly coppice regrowth, as, as others have described. So Paddy's Range is near Maryborough, uh, Pilcher's Bridge uh, south of Bendigo, Castlemaine Diggings 
uh, south of Chewton and of course the the other end of Spring Plains right down the bottom of the, the sort of shoe bit down here and uh, Paul's just been talking about the uh, catchments up the other end so most of my photos are showing down the other end but very similar country. Here's an example of, of one of the thinning types we had three designed three types of thinning this thinning called um, isolated is a, a conventional type approach where you select trees um, and you thin uh, to leave uh, isolated or, or trees standing alone uh, and you you reduce the density the overall uh, um, basal area is a forestry term um, this is an example at Pilchers Bridge, a, a lovely rainy day uh, many years ago. You can see this is a very uh, stark example. This, this is another treatment, a heavy thinning treatment we, we called Patchy One. And uh, this had a, a much higher basal area reduction. And you can see at the very top of this hill, um, there's a, a patch or a small stand of trees. Now, this treatment um, uh, required leaving 10% of the area in, in patches. And I think there's another patch here, but you can see here that um, it's a very wide open. And, and this, this particular site um, was the, the most open thinning because um, it, the, the, there are a higher number of larger trees on the site. And, and I'll mention that uh, towards the end of the talk. Um, this is a classic view of um, Heathy Dry at Castlemaine Diggings. You can see very hilly country. This was a, the, the third type of thinning, which is a kind of hybrid. And we call this patchy two, where um, it was a light or, or medium reduction in basal area, but leaving 25% uh, unthinned. Um, and you can see this very large area here in the middle, in the foreground, and then trees uh, left on the ground. You see here um, a different effect depending on where you're standing. Uh, so I just thought I'd quickly show some um, visual stuff to uh, highlight uh, the effect. Uh, th these aerial photos, courtesy of, of Google Earth, are, are 14 years apart. And um, uh, what's what's nice about this site is uh, this is obviously Spring Plains down the bottom. Uh, you can our, our thirty hectare plots are all side by side. So um, the each each treatment had uh, fifteen one hectare plots scattered amongst four coarse woody debris removal and I won't really get into that that's a, sort of a complication you can see here at the top um, this was the open or isolated thinning with where the trees are um, the trees left from the thinning um, are uh, sort of by themselves if you like and that reduction was about 50% um, 50% uh, 50, 50 retention so um, sorry 50% reduction getting mixed up here. The next site down here is the patchy one or the heavier thinning. And you can see what's obvious. There are small patches here um, left behind, but there are more open spaces and it's a sort of a more stark version. This third block here is the control. Um, and you can see the uh, existing ridge and gully pattern, the, the bare ridges and the uh, more densely treed gullies. And then finally, down the bottom, this sort of hybrid with, with uh, quite large patches left behind and, and a sort of a moderate type of thinning. And then uh, very recently, you can see how uh, canopy is uh, restored, particularly the top two blocks. Um, and that's the, the effect that's not been measured. Um, uh, one of the projects we did in 2009 was to use um, a hemispherical uh, photography from the, the ground plots to measure light penetration and have an empirical measurement. Um, and that'd be nice to do again. Uh, and then down the bottom of the uh, patchy two is less obvious. Um, but anyway, that's that's the outcome and uh, quite a, 
quite a good effect. Uh, here's some before and afters. This is 2003 uh, before thinning at, um, at particular in the open thinning site, uh, heathy dry lots of sort of box, grey box, bit of, um, uh, and red stream duck. Uh, here's, here's the one of the plots when it's it's just been thinned and um, again open thinning it's got a mixture in this uh, gully with there's a sort of a track running through the middle and there are actually quite a, a number of large trees all, all the large trees were left behind so part of the the bias in this from a experimental point of view was that we um, left all the big trees and the, the the best sites at any of these reserves were actually left in uh, the control section, which is a sort of double bias. Um, and then finally, um, just very recently, you can see uh, the understories grown back a bit. The the debris on the ground is less apparent. You've even got uh, uh, naturally fallen tree here and branches uh, following storms. Uh, background to gray everlasting is a bit more obvious, and what you can't see in the photo is um, the tremendous number of um, herbaceous species, flowering orchids and um, some sub shrubs, uh, herbertia and um, some of the peas and acacias. Um, and so this, this, this is just, a, a, I guess, a, vi a visual s signal that uh, we're going in the right direction and that the understory regeneration with grasses and other things has, um, uh, I guess, increased, even if um, all the same species uh, might have been found in the area. Uh, just very quickly, uh, pick the eyes out of this. This is taken from a report uh, by Jeff Brown in 2016 that summarised all, all of the project work. Uh, the, the main thing here was um, the increase in basal area over about eight years uh, in 2015, 16, um, and particularly um, these three trees, so longleaf box, red box, and red stringy bark. Um, and certainly the red red box, red stringy, and gray box seem to respond very well in the canopy to by thinning. Uh, red iron bark is a much slower growing tree and uh, it seems to have done okay, but it doesn't measure measure as well. It's a bit more slow growing. So fine and coarse little loads increased. Um, one of the one of the really important long term features is the generation of hollows and uh, hollow bearing uh, bro broken limbs and so on, and the development of the maturing of eucalypt trees so that they create a whole range of habitats and uh, we're kind of not there yet. But uh, we did measure hollows at the beginning, um, and also there there are various patterns of increase of, of cover of vegetation, uh, not so much changes of species, but uh, covers of um, uh, perennial shrubs, sub shrubs, and interestingly, grasses and uh, gra perennial grasses like Joyce here are really evident in that photo I just showed. Um, some of the fauna stuff, um, birds are particularly interesting. Um, we've done a number of bird surveys and um, the most interesting thing is the change of what are called functional groups. So the birds that feed on bark or in the understory and uh, they have, uh, they've certainly increased in relation to the type of thinning, um, but, but no, no apparently uh, no detriment uh, thinning doesn't doesn't actually have a negative impact um, the other the interesting things uh, that we'd like to do again is is survey for bats as everyone knows bats are uh, incredibly important part of the fauna but we don't see them because uh, they're predominantly nocturnal and, and a bit secretive um, and there was one of the common bats did increase uh, in direct relationship to the, the the type of thinning. And I think that's just because they had more space to fly around in. 
Um, but bats are great survivors and, and a really good indicator of, of habit, tree type habitats. Um, uh, surveys for mammals before and after were really difficult because uh, there, there were very low numbers of animals recorded in, in both surveys. Uh, that, that's a longer term effect. And finally, uh, invertebrates, which are which tend to be a bit unloved, but we um, we were very fortunate in the project to have uh, the late Alan Yen uh, working um, as part of the as part of ARI's fauna team, and he uh, stuck he set out to do a, a whole ambitious range of invertebrates, but ended up focusing on ants, and found that there was a a, a strong correlation to disturbance. With, with species richness and and numbers of ants, um, and that that uh, that uh, affect uh, dying coming away, and that really was supported in the literature. That was a sort of predicted thing. So uh, coming to the end, we, we had a number of issues um, as a an organisation. Um, certainly, there were some biases in the plot selection and. Um, the science team weren't in, weren't heavily involved in uh, site and plot selection. That was done by operations people. They certainly had better opera uh, knowledge of of local forests, but um, there were 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 some long lasting issues. Um, the methodology around estimating um, basal area is interesting, and predominantly uh, forestry people will determine a um, a, a set basal area to target and our project uh, in fact went for a reduction type um, theme and what that meant was that because the uh, stem density uh, across all the sites varied so considerably from between each other but also the estimates at the beginning of the project um, the result was quite variable so Ultimately, we've ended up with quite a, a variation across the four sites and um, uh, treatments. Uh, and, and the inclusion of the coarse woody debris treatment nearly killed the project. Um, it was very labour intensive. And whilst it looked good on paper to, to better study debris and invertebrates and, and uh, kind of the idea of the role of debris, um, it turned out to be incredibly expensive to remove, uh, caused all, all sorts of um, OHS issues. And it also um, meant that the project ended up being, it contributed to spreading the project over three years instead of perhaps two, two or, or one long year. So uh, that, that's the sort of thing that you don't know in advance. Um, I mentioned the separate, the, op the, the operations and science people always got on really well, but there wasn't a direct connection between the management of these groups. And I would always do that different, differently in the future. Training uh, and knowledge transfer to uh, field staff is really important. A lot of um, some of the operatives uh, were experienced um, tree fallers and, and really sort of understood the, the dark art of estimating basal area and other people didn't. And uh, we had quite a few problems at the end of the project with different teams disagreeing about, um, you know, what it should look like. Um, and uh, yeah, really the, uh, the use of volunteers was essential in the end because uh, uh, the, the, some of the timber was removed and, and uh, given to charity, which uh, turned out to be extremely popular. Uh, and so, basically sorry, Patrick. What, what we, we learned that. Um, sorry, Patrick. We, we might have to wrap it up soon. So, is it possible to? Uh, yep, flip? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yep, sorry. I, yeah, no, I'm just running out of time. That's all. Yeah, yeah. So, look. Essentially, there's a lot of potential in the future. Um, lots of potential, new, new, and um, renewing old partnerships. Um, essentially, we've got a. a incredible resource to to build on to keep monitoring and understanding um, and, and measuring 
all of the things we've been talking about today and uh, um, continuing to promote uh, ecological thinning as a mainstream conservation management tool. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. There's a, quite a few questions about this and I'm very keen to get to them, but we also have uh, Glenn, I still believe is here. Is that right, Glenn? That's, that's correct. Thank you, Paul. I know you're the last of the day, but that's, you know, that's the best. We've, we saved the best till last, so oh, away I'm you flattered. go, Glenn. I'm flattered. Thanks. Thank you for having me and um, thanks to Bylinks for the opportunity. Um, I will keep it brief so we can allow for um, question time. Um, and um, um, and they're really looking forward to the conversation and questions. I just want to acknowledge that I'm currently sitting on Tonorong country. Uh, the project site example um, is in Jajarung country. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, the enduring connection um, to country of all First Nations people of Australia. Um, I'm the healthy landscapes manager for Bush Heritage across Victoria, which is essentially a operations and, and regional management role with our field staff and, um, and and i guess in this short discussion i just really want to reinforce the key, key themes of this symposium um, around leaky landscapes and how important it is to address um, this hydrological dysfunction and acknowledge historical disturbance um, in any restoration um, initiatives um, the, the brief example i'd like to use is um, of one of our sites and, and, and the longest site that we've had in Victoria, um, Nardu Hills. It's, um, we've had Nardu Hills for about 10 years now and it's, it's, it's predominantly um, or dominated by metaphor, metamorphic slopes, Hillcrest, Herbridge, Woodland and, and Grassy Woodlands. Um, I'm gonna share my screen shortly. Um, it's around the Wedderburn area on the Western flanks of the Wichitella Nature Conservation Reserve. And um, as I said, we've, it, it's it's a it's a aggregation of a number of blocks that we've we've purchased over time. And um, even though that it's been a um, this particular site's been a conservation reserve for ten plus years, um, we still haven't addressed uh, and still overlooked um, critical landscape processes like how water moves through the landscape, and um, and factoring in our historical disturbance regime and uh, what our significant soil compaction is doing. Uh, and undermining our um, restoration efforts. So I just have a couple of quick couple of pages to share with you, uh, and then we'll go into um, some question time. This is a project that Bush Heritage are working with. Um, have you got that, Paul? Uh, here we go. So not yet. Yep, here it, it's coming. Oh, yeah. I think. Um, it may look familiar, Paul. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this is a project. Uh, in collaboration with Biolinks and with um, um, with Jarjarung, um, Jara and, and, and Jandak Commercial Enterprise. Um, so I just wanted to show this slide here as that we, we stratified it into three broad um, stratifications uh, on the colluvial valley lower slopes, um, the moderate slopes and the steep rocky slopes. Um, so a very discreet and a very um, a yeah, very discreet sort of micro watershed uh, that we've been managing for 10 plus years. Um, Paul undertook some, um, some basic NDVI um, to see what the feedback um, was for that, to see how this micro watershed was, was functioning. This is the, the broad three stratifications that we have on this site. This being the colluvial valley lower slopes and I guess the feedback from the NDVI signals was quite um, insightful, but quite confronting at the same time. So um, basically what we're seeing here is that the moisture retention or the productivity um, across these three um, stratified areas um, are exactly, more or less exactly the same. So our, our moisture retention um, on the rocky slopes, the moderate slopes, and the lower colluvial slopes is more or less exactly the same. So that's as alarming that is, that is really honed where our restorations are going to start. And I get, again, I just want to reinforce the key themes of, of this symposium on how leaky landscapes, unless those key landscape processes are addressed, um, it's going to significantly undermine any restoration efforts. 
So this is a key driver now for a, a watershed repair project that we're doing with, with JARA and Biolinks Alliance, uh, where we're, we're going to be focusing on the hydrology of the site, our water moves through the landscapes, um, ameliorating our significant soil compaction from past you know, high stocking levels uh, through strategic revegetation, um, total grazing pressure management, and looking to increase that rain use efficiency on those moderate um, on those moderate slopes. So um, I'm happy to take any questions on this. I will wrap it up there because we're at the quarter to five. Um, but again, yeah, just wanted to have, use this opportunity to reinforce the key themes of this um, symposium on um, leaky landscapes. Thank you. What, wonderful, Glenn. We're very lucky to have Glenn and Bush Heritage as one of our partners, and we're extremely excited about that project and other collaborative activities that we're doing. So, look, uh, we don't have much time, so we'll just go straight to questions and just treat it as a panel. And I'd like to get people to speak to their questions if they can. There's a first question there from Bert about um, Peter's presentation at the start. So, Bert, if, if you're still there, hopefully you are, you can just ask that question directly. Um, thanks, Paul. It's gone off my screen, but I think the main question was whether, Peter, you considered um, staggering the thinning to reach your final um, density, you know, your stocking rates rather than all in one hit. And seeing as you didn't, what you what you're thinking around that was? What was your decision process? Um, no, it's only, well, one of the decisions was that uh, we did think about it. We've actually got one of our, we've got a series of treatment areas and one of those is half half the, well, sorry, twice the density of the, the other areas. So it's a little bit more dense. Um, we'll see how that goes. Um, but really, yeah, we felt we needed to go direct. It's only a small area of the 100 hectares of, of work, of area that we could have worked in. It's only four hectares of it. So we thought we'd go for broke and go for the go for the ideal amount that um, we'd, we'd learnt from other places and just see how it goes. I think, I think you've got to make a big, you've got to make a big hole in the in the canopy and a hole in the in the tree density to make a difference. Um, the other thing is just mentioning is that I think it's ripping is also an important part of what we've done because we do have some areas where there are no virtually no trees, just bare ground, even less litter than in that other area. Um, there's a crust on the ground and nothing is growing. So it's not just about tree density. That's the other important point. Thank you for that. Um, I noticed that Karen and or Karen B and Barry have asked uh, similar questions about leaving the fallen trees on the ground. So would either of those um, two like to ask that question directly or, or, or to anyone in particular or just the panel? My question was towards Peter. It's Karen, Peter. Karen. Just wondering what you were doing with the vegetation that was getting cut down. I didn't hear these mention that. I didn't. I didn't mention it. Um, it. The plan at the moment is maybe collect some for firewood um, for charity, uh, but most of it will be left on the ground. Gary's filled it in a way that it crosses the slope. So it's really important part of, of the ongoing recovery process for the ecosystem. Um, it's, it's actually probably reduced the fire danger. And the, the, the trees are, have very small heads. They're all stem and no head. So there's not a lot of additional fire risk in those areas to be removed. So most of that tree will remain on the ground. Yeah, uh, I should, yeah, I, I agree with that, that um, yeah, the fallen trees should be left as, a, as resistance to movements of moisture and other things, but, but a, a, a proportion of it can certainly be taken um, as part of the process. Um, John Fawcett's asked another question about sugar gliders, John. Do you, are you still there? Yeah, I think it got answered. It was- Oh, uh, oh okay. They were, they, um, yeah, no, actually I think they got answered before, yeah. Mm -hmm. No worries. All right, um, Kylie, um, Kylie Durant, you would like to ask a question about clearing permits? Oh, I think that got answered as well, but I, oh. um, so the answer is, yeah, you might need them. Um, I was wondering about ongoing germination of ukes, like, you know, in wet years like this, we can get another, another sort of mass germination of, especially around stringy bark around this area. Is that something you have to contend with on any of the sites? And that's open to all. 
we'll wait and see on our side. Um, yeah. <laughs> you, Gary, you got some comments on that? Mm. Yeah, I strongly suspect that a lot of the germination events that we do get would have once upon a time been managed through cultural burning or some type of management intervention. Um, yeah, and lots of this germination is because of disturbed landscapes, but it is a lot easier to remove smaller eucalypts than it is big ones. So get into it sooner. Thank you, Gary. Um, yeah, I'll just, just make a quick comment. Um, <clears throat> in, in our uh, thinning trial sites, um, there, there are, I guess it's, it differ, differs between species and, uh, and so there just seems to be the, the you know, a, a slow amount of regeneration or from seedling in amongst, because uh, some of our sites have got a lot of regenerating understories. So it's quite a different scenario to Peter's um, and even the one that uh, um, Paul's outlining where, where you're trying to regenerate a severely degraded area so it doesn't seem to it seems to be less of a problem um i'm certainly very familiar with this uh in red gum and that's a whole other story <laughs> i won't talk about that thanks patrick um vander millison melissa have you um got that question about thinning after fire i don't want to unmute it you there vander well, uh, maybe it's not there. Uh, is tree thinning okay to do after fires? And if so, how many years should you wait? Anyone got some thoughts on that one? Uh, oh, it's, it's Patrick again. Look, I know um, Delp and, and Parks Victoria do a little bit of uh, thinning around after fire or particularly control burns in relation to safety um, at, rather than for ecological reasons. Um, and I, I don't know that there's a, a connection. I think it, it, it's most important to have an objective and a plan. So um, just you really, I, I think one of the previous speakers said, you really know what you what you, what you want to do. And rather than be opportunistic, um, unless, you're de unless you decide that you want to combine fire and thinning, uh, you have to have another reason really to do that. That's, that's what I reckon. I, I wouldn't mm -hmm. want to mix it up. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, there's another question uh, from Bert, a bit of a dialogue with Cam and I think um, some others, Sean as well, just about uh, the unintended uh, collateral damage from poisoning trees. Um, maybe Gary might have uh, answered that or maybe one of those guys might um, want to elaborate on the question. Yeah, I can comment on that, but Gary, go first. He, he's, a, he's a practitioner. So yes, well, with regard to the unintended consequences, you need to be very careful about the application of herbicides near big trees, um, especially if you're cutting a lot of small stems or even larger stems near a bigger tree. Potentially leave some of the stumps up higher and do... 10% or 20% of the trees initially come back next year, cut the stumps afresh uh, of another 10% or just greatly reduce the herbicide uses, but be very careful about big trees because they're precious. Yeah, I, I concur with that, Gary, because in our project, the uh, we, used, uh, we used Roundup on stumps as a method to try to cut down on coppicing and uh, the, 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 Crews found that uh, early on, a lot of trees were killed because um, in heavily coppice country, uh, what look like single uh, separate small trees are actually connected underground. They're, they're actually old regrowth from a very, very large veteran 120 years ago. And you can't see where the, the trees rotted away. So you have to be really careful depending on, on the country. Um, we had to go back and, and do some cough coppice knocking anyway um, and and that's because in some sites we had uh, that that kind of very very high density like you know 12 to 1500 stems per hectare uh, and it was just very difficult to do uh, but just be very wary of herbicide use that's what I reckon too. 
Um, just to say, time. I'll just uh, uh, recount recount Anne McGregor's question about the, given the benefits that seems to be coming from thinning. You know, is there any plan to implement this more widely in the parks estate? That's, I guess, a question for you, Patrick. Um, look, this is uh, look. I was talking to uh, a very uh, senior um, uh, field staff member the other day about this. We're, we're all a bit frustrated that. Uh, we haven't got a lot of momentum. Um, we've got a lot of evidence. We've got community support, but we, we haven't been in a position to get uptake um, of thinning in parks and reserves. And I think it's all about it's partially culture. Like we 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 do a lot of burning. We we kill weeds and and uh, vertebrate pests uh, with, with gay abandon almost. Um, but it's all about the funding. Like we. We're just not, uh, Parks Victoria's uh, district staff have very, very small budgets for other types of restoration work and th thinning is quite labour intensive. You need a lot of planning and um, and then we've also got the requirement, the OHS requirement to use machinery um, and that's more expensive than, than chainsaw thinning. So um we're we're hoping you know the the, the great uh, uh in fact uptake by uh ngos and community uh for thinning is is eventually going to um get government to pay uh, pay attention i guess make money available in special projects um we're 20 years out from the establishment of the parks project and and thinning was meant to be a major component and and this trial is essentially all we've done. So, uh, yeah, can't really answer that. Thanks, Patrick. Um, look, I'm aware that we're very close to five o'clock and uh, I think we want to stick to it, don't we, Sasha and Sophie? Um, so, uh, unfortunately, there, there are a few other questions it'd be nice to get to, but um, what, what do you guys think about us um, wrapping it up now or go a little bit longer? What's your feel for that? We will um, record um, all the questions that are in the chat are getting recorded um, and we will endeavour to answer as many of them as possible from this session, as well as the ones that we missed throughout the day. So you reckon wrap it up at five as we've planned, of course? Yeah. Ideally, yeah. yeah okay. I know Sophie has a few things to add to the conclusion. All right. Well, I'll just, um, I think we'll do that. So I want to thank the speakers. Um, this afternoon, I'm sorry it was a bit of a rush there towards the end. May, may, may have jammed a few too many in there, but uh, I want to thank um, uh, yeah, Peter and Gary and, um, and Shane and Patrick and Glenn finally as well. Thank you so much for your contributions. It's been a fabulous session. And I'm sorry we can't continue to talk and discuss these issues as we may normally do if we're doing it face to face. So. Thanks very much for your time and for your contributions. I'll hand over to Sophie to wrap things up. Thanks, Paul, and, and uh, my thanks to all the presenters in that really interesting session too. Um, and thank you all for staying with us. Um, it's now five o'clock on fr a Friday night, but, but now we're, a lot of you are probably all in lockdown and you don't know what day it is like me, so it doesn't really make a difference. But anyway, it is Friday night and um, I do want to let you all go very soon. But I want to um, just wrap up by thanking um, our sponsors again today, um, the Ross Trust and the City of Greater Bendigo in particular for their su specific support for this, um, this symposium. Um, uh, so, and as Sasha said, all the video sessions today will be made available as videos to watch online and we'll email you in a couple of weeks to let you know when you can access them. Um, I also just want to add that we had originally planned to have a field day on the back of this. We were optimistically thinking that restrictions might ease and we might be able to have a day outdoors going and visiting some of these, um, some of these sites, which would be, would have been wonderful to do. Um, but we will, we've got a rain check on it. We'll do it as soon as, as, as Paul said earlier, the, the clouds lift and, and we can um, get out and about again. And so we'll let you know when that happen, when that's happening and hopefully you'll be able to join us. Um, look, I also just want to mention that um, we're still uh, working hard to raise the um, uh, remaining funds that need to be raised to fully fund the Springs Plains project. At the moment, it's all been uh, developed to this point on the back of, of, of philanthropy and the philanthropic trust that Paul acknowledged earlier in the talk. Um, 
uh, we really want to implement the project in full um, next year or begin next year. It's a two year project. So if you are interested in donating, um, please go to our website. Um, uh, any contributions to help make that project happen and be a sort of a model demonstration for the sorts of things that we could and possibly should be, should be doing a lot more broadly, that would be quite wonderful. So, um, and yes, what else? I thank everybody for being with us today. Uh, tremendous to have you all and the interest in, in the topic. Um, look, it's been a, a fabulous day talking about repairing ecosystems from the bottom up, fixing the hydrology of systems. And to see that food web flourish and respond, it's been particularly great incorporating sort of the farming landscapes with the more bush landscapes and seeing the wonderful overlap. Um, and because it's really, we do need to integrate these landscapes and, and think about them as a whole, um, as they are, as they do function as a whole and bringing together these different, different um, uh, you know, perspectives and, and, and uh, is, it has been wonderful. Um, uh, I, I think um, we can all agree that um, this sort of work is especially going to be especially important um, in the time uh, within climate change, in time of climate change, holding water in the landscape and bringing back productivity and biodiversity is going to be more Im important than ever um, as systems get more stressed with um, declining rainfall and increasing temperatures and variability. So um, in really important symposium, wonderful to be talking about um, these tough approaches to restoration. Um, we haven't mentioned tree planting all day, I'm not saying it's not important, but we really do need to raise the profile of these sort of bottom up fundamental approaches to fi fixing ecosystems. And, and I think today was a great um, kind of uh, bringing together of, of the thinking and the wonderful um, practice that's already going on in this in this area and um, uh, thank you all for being part of it. <laughs>